Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and uh, with me today, as per usual, is my good friend Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Mike. Why do you sound like Kathleen Turner today? <laughs> Why do I sound the <laughs> the smoky tones of uh, Kathleen Turner brought to you by COVID-19? Oh, no. Yes. So just so you know, I'm not exposing Matthew to COVID because he is not here. He and I record remotely. So, <laughs> yeah, I may have to stop and cough and all that kind of stuff. And just to pull the curtain back a little bit, we had already recorded this show parts of it and i was going to record the rest of it today but your voice is so different my voice is so different we have to redo it because it was (laughs) it's going to sound ridiculous can you imagine hi welcome to dark poutine this is mike brown (laughs) yeah exactly yeah and people be like what's wrong something's not right (laughs) mike's having a bipolar day (laughs) right and before we get started we have to point out that this is dark poutine's sixth anniversary show and it's hard to believe that i've been at this for this long and matthew and i have been at it for three years craziness right and uh i want to thank everyone of you who continue tuning in to this little show every week and we're so grateful that we get to share these stories with you And my life has changed a lot since uh, Dark Poutine launched on Halloween in 2017. And there's been so many incredible high moments, too many to mention, and frankly, a lot of personal and professional adversity. So you folks have seen me through a lot, and I appreciate it. It means so much that there are so many of you who stuck with us from the beginning. I really, really appreciate it. I am grateful for you. And this is also our Halloween episode. Oh my gosh, it's all kinds of things. It's Mike's <laughs> COVID-19 episode. It is the uh, sixth anniversary episode. And it is, yeah, Halloween. And do you know what I'm doing? I don't know what you're doing. Now that I'm my, my own boss, I'm going to take Fridays to write episodes. That's good. That yeah. will help me out a lot. Yeah. That will be awesome. Let's get on with it. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Jack Fiddler was a chief and shaman among the Anishinaabe in northwestern Ontario. Born around 1839, he became renowned for his abilities in white magic, particularly his claim power to defeat the Wendigo, a cannibalistic spirit. Fiddler asserted that he had vanquished 14 Wendigos during his lifetime. Some of these were believed to be sent by enemy shamans, while others were individuals from his community who developed an uncontrollable craving for human flesh. 
In many instances, families asked him to euthanize a gravely ill loved one to prevent them from turning into a Wendigo. In 1907, the Northwest Mounted Police arrested Jack and his brother Joseph Fiddler for the alleged murder of a woman believed to have turned Wendigo. The arrest was part of a broader effort to impose Canadian law on Indigenous communities. The story garnered significant media attention, with many newspapers sensationalizing the events. Jack Fiddler died by suicide while in custody, and although Joseph went to trial and was convicted, he passed away in 1909, shortly before an order for his release arrived. This is Dark Poutine episode 291, Spooktober 5, the story of Jack Fiddler, Wendigo Killer. This is, as we mentioned, our Halloween episode. This story combines so many elements that I am fascinated with, and the tale of Jack Fiddler fits perfectly with the feel of Dark Poutine, so I've kept it for this special occasion. For most among these elements that I'm intrigued by is the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a supernatural entity rooted in the spiritual traditions of Algonquin-speaking First Nations in North America. These beings are often depicted as powerful monsters with a cannibalistic nature. Legends suggest that humans can transform into Wendigos due to their own greed or vulnerability. These creatures are feared for their bloodlust and their ability to corrupt individuals or entire communities with malevolence. The tales warn against isolation and selfishness and emphasize the significance of community. The name Wendigo has various spellings and pronunciations depending on the specific Algonquin-speaking group, such as the Abenaki, Siksika, Mi'kmaq, Algonquin, Ojibwe, and Innu. The creature's appearance and abilities also vary. Some describe it as a skeletal being with ashen skin, while others see it as a giant that grows with each meal. It's often depicted with traits like sunken or glowing eyes, sharp teeth, and foul odor. They possess supernatural abilities, including immense strength, speed, and the power to walk on snow or water without sinking. According to Basil Johnson, an Ojibwe teacher and scholar from Ontario, on the Legends of America site, quote, The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tautly over its bones, with its bones pushing out against its skin. Its complexion, the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets. The Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody. Its body was unclean and suffering from suppurations of the flesh, giving off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition of death and corruption. End quote. That's how I remember my ex. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Your poor ex. Not all my exes, just one specific ex. Just a soul-destroying cannibal? Yeah, felt like that at the end. <laughs> Pretty much. The Wendigo legend has ancient roots in Algonquin oral history, predating European arrival in North America. Early European accounts, like that of Jesuit missionary Paul Lejeune in the 17th century, documented these tales. Paul Lejeune is best known for his work in New France, present-day Canada, and his efforts to convert the indigenous peoples to Christianity. Lejeune lived among the Algonquin-speaking peoples, notably the Montagne, the Innu, and learned their languages and customs as part of his missionary work. One of the significant aspects of his time in New France was his documentation of the lives, beliefs, and practices of indigenous peoples he encountered. These accounts were published in a series of writings known as the Jesuit Relations, which provided detailed descriptions of the native cultures and the Jesuits' missionary activities. Now, this is the point of the show, Mike, where we, we do our, our special section, Fun Facts About the Jesuits. Fun Facts About <laughs> the Jesuits, oh no. So, they actually helped define modern theater. So mm -hmm. in, in the 16th and 17th century, the missionaries used drama as a tool for spreading Christianity to cultures around the world. That's a good idea, really. Yeah, it's they, you know, brought it to life, right? Mm -hmm. Adapt, they adapted local languages and traditions to create th performances. 
Sure. He incorporated music and, and set. So much of what modern theater is today is, mm-hmm. uh, is from the Jesuit. That's really cool. Jesu- Jesu- Jesuits. 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 It's the Jesuits. Jesuits. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. In the Jesuit relations, Lejeune made mention of the Wendigo legends. He recorded stories and beliefs about this supernatural entity described as a cannibalistic monster or spirit. The Wendigo was feared among the Algonquin-speaking peoples for its insatiable hunger for human flesh. According to the legends, humans could turn into Wendigos due to extreme hunger, greed, or under the influence of the spirit itself. Lejeune's accounts are significant because they provide one of the earliest European records of the Wendigo legends. His writings offer insights into how these legends were perceived and understood by indigenous communities during the 17th century. While Lejeune approached these stories from a Christian perspective and often interpreted them in the context of his missionary goals, his documentation remains a valuable historical resource for understanding the cultural and spiritual beliefs of the indigenous peoples of New France. In the 20th century, the term Wendigo was adopted by Western psychiatry to describe a condition where patients believed they were possessed by cannibalistic desires. This so-called Wendigo psychosis remains a topic of debate in the medical community but made its way into the Bible of psychiatry, the dsm 4 While its symptoms aren't strictly defined, specific attributes are often seen in affected individuals. Some people with this condition exhibit two phases, an initial period of lethargy and indifference followed by a phase characterized by violent behavior and cannibalistic tendencies. Often these individuals initially display symptoms of anorexia, which might evolve into a desire for human flesh. Other symptoms include insomnia, panic attacks, and intense fears. Some theories suggest deficiencies in specific vitamins or nutrients, like vitamin B, protein, fat, or ascorbic acid, might trigger these symptoms. For instance, suddenly reducing fat intake can lead to severe headaches, and if prolonged, can be fatal. This is particularly relevant for people living in subarctic regions, where high-fat diets are typical due to high energy needs. Additionally, thiamine deficiency can lead to symptoms like stomach problems, unease, fatigue, and in severe cases, psychosis. Diagnosis of the psychosis, (laughs) that rhymes, is primarily centered on uncontrollable cannibalistic urges and actions, accompanied by symptoms like sleeplessness, hallucinations, severe depression, and weight loss. Historically, shamans from North American indigenous tribes took on the role of healers for those afflicted. Out of 26 diagnosed cases, natural healing methods were used for six, with three of them resulting in a cure. A more drastic approach involved killing 15 people, exhibiting these behaviors while one individual took their own life. For recovery, two elements were deemed essential, an individual's ability to control their impulses and a decreased internal compulsion. Starvation is frequent in those suffering from Wendigo psychosis, leading to attempts at treatment through proper nourishment. One narrative from the Cree Nation speaks of a woman who, after cannibalizing her family, was treated and healed with a drink made from bear fat. After consuming it, she vomited up ice and was restored to health. Other traditional treatments included meals like wild rice with duck fat or meat, Some reports indicate that consistent meals led to recovery, highlighting the significant impact of famine on the syndrome and its symptoms. Another debated treatment involved drinking hot water or grease believed to melt ice, thought to be present in a sufferer's heart and veins. In contemporary times, Wendigo psychosis is primarily treated using medications, of course. The specific antipsychotic drugs, dosage, and administration method depend on the type and stage of the illness and individual factors. Initial treatments typically start with low doses, which can be adjusted based on response, emphasizing maximum benefits while minimizing side effects. Benzodiazepines, which were some of my favorites, are the first line of treatment followed by second-generation antipsychotics. 
Treatment typically shows results in 10 to 14 days, but should be continued for a minimum of 3 to 5 years due to the recurring nature of the condition. I think bennies are probably a better way of treating someone with mental illness than homicide. Sure, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) We don't want to be killing people who are mentally ill, even if they are violent. Exactly. That isn't the right way to do it. Oh, no. No. Some experts believe Wendigo psychosis might be an extreme variant of psychotic depression given symptoms like hallucinations, anorexia, sleep disturbances, and the compulsion toward cannibalism. Psychosis typically involves disruptions in thought processes, awareness, and perception. Those suffering from it firmly believe in their delusions, often leading to disillusionment and difficulty accepting reality. Factors like prolonged isolation during winter and chronic hunger are thought to be triggers for Wendigo psychosis, potentially leading to cannibalistic tendencies. The Wendigo stories offer insights into indigenous beliefs, lifestyles, and social structures. They highlight the importance of community cooperation and the dangers of isolation. The creature's insatiable greed mirrors societal attitudes about sharing, especially in environments where survival depends on communal effort. In modern interpretations, the Wendigo symbolizes issues like capitalism, corporate consumerism, and the challenges faced by indigenous communities, including the impacts of colonization. Recently, the Wendigo has gained traction in Western popular culture, inspiring films, novels, TV shows, comics, artworks, and literary works by renowned figures like Norval Morisot, Margaret Atwood, and Joseph Boyden. This has added to the legend's diversity and interpretation among Indigenous and non-Indigenous audiences. If you've gone back through the Dark Poutine episode archive, you'll know that we have spoken about Wendigo before, specifically in episode 25, the story of Swift Runner. Swift Runner was a Cree trapper and guide in the late 19th century. He was known to be a large and powerful man standing over six feet tall. In the winter of 1878 and 79, Swift Runner and his family faced starvation in the wilderness. They were about 25 miles from the nearest Hudson's Bay Company post where they could have sought help. However, Swift Runner succumbed to a dark impulse instead of seeking assistance. When he returned to civilization in the spring, he was alone. Suspicion arose when he began to speak of his family in the past tense. Upon investigation, authorities discovered the remains of Swift Runner's family near the winter camp. It became evident that Swift Runner had killed and consumed his wife and five children. Swift Runner confessed to the murders and cannibalism, claiming he was influenced by the Wendigo. Swift Runner's claims of being possessed by the Wendigo did not spare him from the consequences of his actions. He was tried and found guilty and hanged in Fort Saskatchewan in 1879. Some stories even suggest that individuals accused of being Wendigos were killed as a preventative measure. This brings us to Jack Fiddler. Jack Fiddler, born Mezzanini, a Cree name meaning a stylish person, was an Ojibwe shaman and leader of the Sucker People at Sandy Lake in present-day northern Ontario. Born in the 1830s or early 40s, he was the son of Pimichikag, a prominent leader and shaman in the Upper Severn region. While Jack's father's ancestry remains a mystery, family lore suggests he had magical beginnings. Legend has it that he emerged as a fully formed adult, and when first observed, he was atop a lodge proclaiming, I am known as the porcupine standing sideways. I've existed in this world before, and now I've returned. For their trapping efforts, Hudson's Bay Company provided the Sucker Clan with commodities like weapons, apparel, and liquor in return. At the time, some Cree incorporated alcohol into their ceremonies and medicinal practices. This strongly motivated the Sucker Clan and other tribes to collaborate with the HBC. The Sucker community overhunted their wildlife for about 30 years, decreasing pelts and sustenance. Although a few ventured into trade hubs, most clan members rarely interacted with white colonists. In the Upper Severn District, Pimichikag faced challenges as beaver and caribou numbers dwindled after their prolonged trapping and hunting activities to meet the demands of European-led companies. As the leader of the Sucker Clan, comprising fewer than 100 members, his primary trading was with William McKay, the Hudson's Bay Company postmaster. But other than that, the clan had no other significant interactions with the European settlers. 
they kept to themselves and carried on their traditional practices. Consequently, the broader Sandy Lake Cree faced challenges such as persistent hunger, budding alcohol addiction, and significantly diminished natural reserves. In 1833, records from Windy Lake indicated the tragic deaths of entire families due to starvation. This region, including the areas around Windy, Deer, and Sandy Lakes, was where Pimi Chikag's clan hunted. Despite the closing of the Windy Lake Post that same year and the subsequent hardships, Pimi Chikag established trade at Big Trout Lake after 1844. By 1868, he had acquired goods on credit, including several essential items like blankets, sugar, and salt. The repayment of these debts often proved difficult for him and his clan. Pimichikag's people practiced polygamy, and over his lifetime he had multiple wives and fathered several children. Notably, two of his sons, Jack and Joseph, earned their surname Fiddler by crafting and playing birchwood fiddles during clan festivities. Pimichikag is one of the few indigenous leaders in the 19th century in northern Ontario who didn't sign treaties, thus preserving and practicing his traditions without external influence. Many legends about Pimichikag's mystical abilities have been passed down, including tales where he confronted and banished malevolent Wendigos. According to authors Chad Lewis and Kevin Lee Nelson in their book Wendigo Lore, being a leader and shaman, Pimichikag was tasked with defending his tribe from this mythical beast. One day, sensing the creature's approach, he bravely confronted it armed with a whip, a knife, and an axe. The surroundings became chaotic as they battled, with strong winds and echoing noises. Each time he struck the Wendigo with his whip, it would check its bleeding head. Eventually, the chief defeated the Wendigo. Legend says that the battle site would later echo with thunderous sounds during snow melts, believed to be from the Wendigo's spilled blood. The HBC postmaster at Island Lake reported Pima Chikag's demise in 1891. He noted the significant impact of disease and death among the bands including Pimi Chikag, believed to be 120 years old at the time. Today, Pimi Chikag's legacy lives on through his descendants who bear the surname Fiddler and inhabit regions in Ontario and Manitoba. As a young man between 1857 and 1868, Pimi Chikag's son, Jack Fiddler, sourced hunting supplies from Big Trout Lake. However, in the late 1860s, with the reopening of the Island Lake Post, he resumed trading there, a practice he maintained for most of his life. It's believed that he once worked on the York boats, which transported merchandise between the Post and York factory. From 1887 onward, Hudson's Bay Company documents often identified him as Jack Fiddler, with his community occasionally termed the Fiddler tribe. Following his father's passing in 1891, Jack rose as the leader of the Sandy Lake inhabitants and their neighboring allies, leading between 100 and 120 people, and his influence stretched even to those residing further away. Over his lifetime, he had five wives, with whom he had eight sons and five daughters. Jack Fiddler was considered a great leader and a powerful shaman and mystic who claimed to travel to ten different worlds in his dreams where he gained counsel and knowledge of healing and magic. While he did incorporate Christian ideology into his spiritual practice, including prayer, Fiddler kept to the traditional ways. According to James Stevens' book, Killing the Shaman, Jack Fiddler once told a Methodist missionary, quote, I believe in my dreams. Everything we dream is right for us. By our dreams and singing and conjuring, in the shaking tent, we can see meat, moose, and deer for us. Our dreams are our religions. End quote. Jack Fiddler, though, is primarily remembered for his dispatching of Wendigos. It is assumed as many as 14 and his subsequent arrest for murder by the Northwest Mounted Police, events he allegedly foresaw during one of his dreaming sessions. More after a quick break, but first... Here's the Supernatural Circumstances promo. Hey Dark Poutine listeners, Mike here. Are you ready to dive deep into the mysteries of the supernatural? Join me and award-winning paranormal researcher Morgan Knudsen as we dissect chilling phenomena on supernatural circumstances. From spine-tingling hauntings to creepy cryptids and other paranormal subjects, we'll be your guides on this extraordinary journey. We're in Season 2 right now, so there are plenty of episodes for you to catch up on. Buckle up, 
and explore the unknown with us and numerous expert guests. Download Supernatural Circumstances wherever you podcast. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters, and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat, available now. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. And we are back, Matthew. Uh, any thoughts so far? Yeah, this this one's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Killing people with mental health issues is obviously problematic, right? P- it's co- it's wor- it's worse than problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm understating it intentionally, right? Yeah. Um, cultural practice and beliefs are not. And while I agree that a hundred percent that. We, we need to respect and understand cultural beliefs of different mm-hmm. communities, including the Algonquin people and yep. their belief in the Wendigo. But I think, you know, we also need to, to recognize that the historical act of killing individuals perceived as Wendigos who simply had mental health issues is a practice that, that just can't go on, right? No, yeah. And I'm going out on a limb here um, to say that uh, contemporary Algonquin people would probably agree right yeah yeah. um so but i think it's 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 important to appreciate the cultural context of things but hold it uphold sort of fundamental human rights of of life and dignity right yeah it's a this one's a bit of a fine line you know like considering cultural sensitivity and absolutely and essentially homicide yes yeah, I mean, it's 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 not like I think it's clear to us now. Back then, mm-hmm. it it was a different time, right? Right. And um and and I think though, like looking at this, it just made me think of um, you know, no society has treated people with mental health very well in history. No cultures did, and and I think everyone's learned over time how to be much more compassionate and and. Uh, have better approaches to prioritize the the well-being of people with mental health challenges. I mean, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and years ago, had a, had it happened to me in the even the early 20th century, the very early 20th century, I would have been locked away in an insane asylum until I died. Mm, yeah, you know. So, if someone was suspected of being a Wendigo or on the verge of becoming one, Jack Fiddler was called in to deal with the situation. According to James Stevens' book, written with Jack Fiddler's grandson, Thomas Fiddler, then chief of the clan, a man was living in a tent who began transforming into a Wendigo. People could hear chilling sounds of ice forming, crushing, and moving inside the man. As he took deep breaths, it seemed he was on the brink of releasing a scream that would complete his transformation into a Wendigo. Upon hearing about this, Jack Fiddler rushed to the scene. He clanged two cans together and sang outside the tent. Upon entering, Jack continued his chant as the man stood frozen. Suddenly, Jack tackled the man to the ground. The man started to scream, but instead of sound, ice emerged from his mouth. Jack dragged the man outside, laid him on the ground, and started whipping him, warning him that if he continued on this path, he'd be whipped to death. Jack sternly told him that if he became Wendigo, he had the power to end his life. The man, known as Watup, or the Root, never underwent the Wendigo transformation again after that encounter. 
Also in Stephen and Fiddler's book, there's a chilling story about a man who worked as a trapper for the Hudson's Bay Company. The narrative tells of a time when this trapper took his family on a winter trapping expedition, but did not return to camp by dusk. Tragically, upon his return, it was revealed he had slain and consumed his own wife and children. An elderly man named John Doggy, sensing the sinister change in the trapper, readied himself to face a potential Wendigo. He gathered tarps, chains, and ropes from the HPC post, preparing for a confrontation. Alongside a group of men, John Doggy approached the trapper upon his return from yet another trip. To their horror, the trapper began transforming into the Wendigo, growing in size and emitting a noise reminiscent of ice shards being crushed. Further adding to the grim scene, they found a bucket the trapper held that contained his children's feet. With John Doggy leading them, the group managed to restrain the transforming trapper and took him to the HBC Lodge. The white men at the lodge used whiskey to revive the creature. When asked about his family's fate, the Wendigo, caught between human emotion and monstrous instincts, responded that they were still alive. Then he corrected himself, admitting to killing them, and broke down in tears. This particular Wendigo was not destroyed, but instead taken to a hospital for psychiatric treatment by the white men present. Few stories survive about the Sucker Clan killing suspected Wendigo, but as we mentioned, Jack Fiddler was alleged to have dispatched as many as 14 in his lifetime. Considering that the Wendigo often appeared during winter famines, it's logical to think that overfishing and overhunting by humans would increase the occurrences of these events. However, even with the rising death toll within the clans, the Hudson's Bay Company consistently denied any issues faced by the clans. The Sucker Clan endured about three generations marked by widespread hunger and rising incidents of Wendigo possession. It wasn't until 1907 when Jack Fiddler and his brother Joseph were taken to court and charged with murder that these issues gained significant attention. In September 1906, near the HBC Post on Sandy Lake in the district of Kiwatan, Chief Jack Fiddler and his brother Joseph decided to take tragic action against Jack's delirious daughter-in-law. The woman, known by several names, including Wasaka Pique, Sapaweste, and Mrs. Thomas Fiddler, had been uncontrollable and showed signs of severe distress since her arrival. Initially, some relatives, including her mother, mother mother-in-law, and husband, restrained her. Later, only two men, Norman Ray and John Ray, stood with the Fiddlers. Norman was related to the Fiddlers through marriage, believing it was necessary to end Sapoeste's suffering and out of fear she might turn cannibalistic. The Fiddlers decided to strangle her using a string. Only when the deed was about to be executed did Angus Ray, another relative, realize their intention and promptly left. Following the tragic event, Jack Fiddler declared they would give her a proper burial. She was wrapped in cotton, and her final resting place was lined with birch bark, over which she was covered before the grave was sealed. Bill Campbell, an official from the HBC, reported the incident, eventually reaching the government. Though the company had historically been lenient with native populations in the north, political pressures were shifting. In a previous incident where Campbell reported a similar tragedy, there had been minimal reaction from the government. However, this time was different. The government sent Constables O'Neill and Cashman to arrest the Fiddler brothers in June 1907 to assert dominance over the territory and began stamping out what they believed to be barbaric practices, including destroying Wendigo and polygamy. The arrest of Jack and Joseph was met with tears and grief from their community. For most of the sucker people, the Mounties were the first whites they had ever seen. The two men in their 70s did not believe they had done anything wrong. Their motivation was to save their community from what they thought was a ravenous Wendigo. They had performed what they believed was a compassionate act of euthanasia. To the Cree, killing a Wendigo was an act of righteousness, not punishment. The Sucker Clan's trust in Jack Fiddler was built on his past actions as a leader and trusted healer. The Hudson's Bay Company, specific government figures, and the police expressed compassion for Jack and Joseph Fiddler, and many hoped the accusations against them would be dismissed. The police were especially concerned about the welfare of the brothers' families during their absence. 
the men were taken by the Northwest Mounted Police from their tiny remote community to a fort community called Norway House in Manitoba, where they were held for trial. Jack was noticeably depressed by his incarceration. While they were in custody, Jack Fiddler tragically took his own life during an allowed stroll in the woods, hanging himself on September 30, 1907. According to Chad Lewis, the media of the day exaggerated the incident of the Wendigo killing. Headlines across Canadian and American newspapers included phrases such as devil worship among the Crees, wholesale murder, and murder's daughter to cast out devil, to name a few. These headlines often depicted the incident as barbaric or associated it with evil or devil-worshipping practices. A 1907 Free Press Prairie Farmer article called the Fiddler Brothers a band of ferocious stranglers. In the racist language of the day, the paper went on to paint Jack Fiddler as a vicious but cowardly supervillain. The article reads in part, quote, Evidence might have been adduced of 20 cases of homicide by Chief Jack, but that wily old ruffian finished his bloodthirsty career of a score of brutal strangulations by strangling himself in the yard of the police barracks at Norway House while the sentry was giving three other prisoners their morning exercise. Chief Jack was over 70 years of age and was a very intelligent man, being able to read the Bible in Cree and talk with the white man and discuss the various points of differences between the Christian religion and the creed of the Cree. Evidence to this effect was given by a local reverend who was a native Methodist missionary. He read the service of the church over the grave of the old strangler suicide. End quote. Only a handful of newspapers highlighted the region's isolation, noting its lack of access to medical facilities and that many inhabitants had never encountered a white person. Joseph Fiddler's trial commenced on October 7, 1907. After hearing testimonies throughout the day, the jury of six faced difficulties arriving at a unanimous decision due to the intricate nature of the case. Aware of the trial's political implications, the judge urged the jury to reach a consensus. They were torn between either convicting Joseph of murder or acquitting him entirely, as no intermediate charges were available. Ultimately, the jury convicted Joseph but pleaded for leniency in his sentencing. Regardless, Commissioner Perry of the Northwest Mounted Police demanded the maximum penalty, and Joseph was sentenced to death by hanging. The trial process was heavily criticized as the Northwest Mounted Police deeply influenced its proceedings, reflecting the government's will more than the community's sentiments. Canadian authorities didn't try to understand the Cree perspective. Instead, they sought to undermine Fiddler's authority and dismiss the Cree belief system entirely. The Canadian authorities had a legal system heavily influenced by Christian teachings, with law enforcers often acting as moral gatekeepers. The gap between religious dogma and Canadian law was thin, demonstrated during a trial where the accused's understanding of right and wrong was questioned through their exposure to Christian beliefs. In this context, the Canadian legal system viewed morality and legality as the same thing. In contrast, the Cree's perception of authority and morality was innately connected to their relationship with the land and community. Authority was shared within the clan and not centered on a singular figure's command. Although shamans and chiefs held respect and wisdom, they didn't have the power to enforce punishment. For the Cree, retribution was a natural consequence of one's actions. Local fur traders and missionaries appealed for Fiddler's penalty to be reduced to life imprisonment. They argued that the act, though gruesome, was committed in line with cultural beliefs and was not motivated by malice. The Indian agency voiced concerns that executing Fiddler might make indigenous people wary of Western civilization. Ultimately, his death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Tragically, a subsequent pardon arrived just days after Joseph's death, likely due to tuberculosis at the Stony Mountain Prison. It sounds like uh, at the end, um, common sense prevailed. Mm -hmm. I don't think this was malice at all. And No. You know me, I'm anti-death penalty for anyone, no matter what you've done. Right. But uh, it's sad that it, it was too late. He got, you know, died in prison. But uh, it, mm -hmm. it's, it sounds like um, from going forward with a very sort of racist, cultural imperialist sort of point of view, it was toned down at the end, but just too late. Right. 
After losing their key leaders, the inhabitants of the Upper Severn River had to submit to the governmental rule. In 1910, Jack's son Robert Fiddler, as the chief of the Deer Lake Band, agreed to an amendment to Treaty 5 and established a settlement at Deer Lake. Subsequently, several families, including the Fiddlers, relocated to Sandy Lake and became members of Treaty 9. Presently, many of Jack Fiddler's descendants reside in Sandy Lake First Nation, while others are in Deer Lake First Nation and North Spirit Lake First Nation in Ontario. Additionally, some live on three reservations at Island Lake in Manitoba. Today, Sandy Lake First Nation is an independent Oji Cree First Nations band government located in the Kenora District of Northern Ontario, Canada. Situated 227 kilometers northeast of Red Lake, Ontario, it had a registered population of 2,474 in June of 2007, which increased to 3,034 by December 2015. The First Nation is a signatory to Treaty 5 and is affiliated with the Nishnabi Aski Nation. The community's land base is the Sandy Lake 88 Reserve, which spans 4,266 hectares. Within this reserve, Sandy Lake has several neighborhoods grouped into five districts, Airport Center, Big Rock Ghost Point, Old Sawmill, River, and Roman Catholic. The community is primarily accessible by air, with airlines such as Wasaya, Superior, and Perimeter providing services. During winter, an ice road connects Sandy Lake to other communities. Education in Sandy Lake is overseen by the Sandy Lake Board of Education, which operates three schools, Thomas Fiddler Memorial Elementary School, Thomas Fiddler Memorial High School, and Washtenagon Christian School. An adult learning center in the community has affiliations with the Confederation College and Lakehead University. The community recognized five clans, or Dudem, Suckers, of which the Fiddlers were a part, Pelicans, Crane, Caribou, and Sturgeon. The primary language is Oji Cree, and the community uses a variant of Western Ojibwe syllabics for writing. Sandy Lake First Nations governance structure consists of an elected chief, deputy chief, and eight councillors. The region experiences subarctic climate with cold winters and mild summers. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode. 291, Spooktober 5, The Story of Jack Fiddler, Wendigo Killer. That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Again, to pull the curtain back a little bit, I made a post on Facebook and Instagram, different places, asking for people to call in. But strangely, when thousands of people usually see... My posts, for some reason, only 231 people saw it, so we got, like, three voicemails. Because <laughs> I wanted people to call in and, and help to celebrate Dark Poutine's sixth anniversary and that kind of thing. But something, it, it was just not meant to be, so. Facebook is weird. Facebook really sucks. <laughs> it really, <laughs> really does suck. You know, I'm getting a lot of really violent videos in my feed now. For some, yeah. re- for some reason, and then I report them, and they say these don't go against our terms of service. And I'm like, how can somebody getting shot in the head? I saw someone reported them as well, and it's like, it's not against their thing. But then if I, like, jokingly call somebody a dickhead, right. I, get, I get flagged for bullying, but it's a friend, right? That's what, how we speak. Right. F- Facebook does not have their shit together. No. Anyway. Enough ranting about Facebook. Let's get on to some voicemails. <laughs> uh, here's our first one. Hi, uh, this is Avril from Guelph, which she most recently referenced in an episode where a youth was detained in our now defunct juvenile detention center. Anyways, I found you a few months ago, and I've been binging. I'm getting dangerously close to the end, um, which is, ah, but anyway. Uh, I wanted to speak to when callers say that you've helped them through hard times. Uh, For me personally, 
it's been very difficult to listen to the radio or music in general because most songs are about love and relationships. Um, for example, right now, uh, a week ago, my relationship blew up in a big way, which involved the police. I just listened to the Barutsky episode, and I'm so grateful to hear the compassion with which intimate partner violence was treated. Um, the police in my incident seemed very concerned, and I think I was brushing it off a little bit too much. This week has been a roller coaster, and listening to the episode with so many similarities uh, to the beginning of the partner violence makes me think that maybe I'm lucky today. Um, I really enjoy how much, especially to males, and I don't even know if Matthew is still doing it because I'm not all the way through, but can talk about their own mental health struggles, especially in a society where men don't necessarily get to hear that. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for the show, all you do, your research. It's all fabulous. Your honesty, your compassion, and drop a deuce in your toque. Thanks, Avril. Wow, that was really nice. And uh, boy, are we ever glad that uh, you got out of that situation. Uh, we are. Yeah. And I'm still here. Matthew's still here. Matthew's <laughs> not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm stuck with you, but I'm good with that. I'm good with being stuck <laughs> with you, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you so much. It re I, I always appreciate it when somebody calls in and can relate that kind of story, uh, especially one that ends positively, uh, even though it sounds like she's going through a tough time emotionally. But it's it's good that you, if there was a, an, any situation like that even beginning, I'm so happy that you got yourself out of it. Yeah. Let's move forward to our next voicemail. Hey, Mike and Matthew. This is Kelsey calling here from Lethbridge. Huge fan. I've been listening to you guys for, gosh, probably three years now. I think I remember when you guys hit 100 episodes. Um. This was a couple of weeks back now, but I was just listening to the episode that you did on the HIV epidemic and the legal cases surrounding that. Um, absolutely loved it. You guys did such a fantastic job with that episode. I always really appreciate Matthew's firsthand experience and eventually, especially how relevant it was to this. Um, as a queer woman myself, I am like fairly familiar with it, but I find a lot of media is very U.S. centric, of course. And so I really loved hearing about Matthew's experience in London, Ontario, and how he had um, such a big hand in like the advertising and the advocacy for all of the victims and everybody else affected. Um, but yeah, I could keep going on forever and ever, but thank you guys for such a great episode and all of your fantastic episodes. Um, you go take a shit in your hat, hey? Um, <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. That was great. Thanks, Kelsey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Little compliments to Matt there. That's very nice. I, I like it when queer women are. Queer women and lesbians um, looked after gay men when they were dying in, yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the gay dudes that, that, that uh, get, get uh, stroppy around lesbians need to remember that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, I'm old school. I'm teaching the youngins, respect your elder lesbians. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious me. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on to our next voicemail before I start hacking up along. Hi, Mike, Matthew, and Steve. My name is Holly, and I'm honking from New Westminster, BC. I just wanted to wish you all a very happy, spooktacular sixth anniversary of Dark Poutine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go shit in your hats, boys. 
<laughs> That's fantastic. That made that was- my day. That was so great, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sad that that's the only happy Halloween voicemail that, that we got. That, that, that is literally the only one we need. <laughs> that's the only one we need. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there in New Westminster, just across the way. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, let's move on to uh, Patreon and Donut Money donors. But first, that's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 327 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick... So we don't have any donut money donors or patrons, new patrons to speak of this week. But times are tough. Times are tough all over. Matthew's unemployed. You know, he got he got his arse fired. I'm sitting here with an open bag saying, trick or treat, motherfuckers. <laughs> oh, no. Poor Matthew. I would like some candy today. You, you would like some candy today. I can send you some. Do you want me to send you a box of candy? No, because Justin will find it and throw it away. <laughs> right, exactly. So I could surreptitiously send it in like a... I don't know, a, a box of, like, cabbages or something. and <laughs> yeah, Make granola. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it for the show. Isn't yeah, it? just a sec oh. here. Uh, DP show in. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Well, that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So from us on our sixth anniversary and Halloween boo, number one, and thank you, number two, and as usual, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, everybody. Bye. I said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Benning. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.